Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ed Bebout with an FYE Section 7 special report. Tonight, our topic is Pakistan. Now, Pakistan is a country that's often in the news, but how much do we really know about the country? Tonight, we'll explore it from a wide range of areas. First up is education. Education is a topic we take for granted in the United States, but you'll find that in Pakistan, it's a much different situation. I'm Ryan. Hi, I'm Caitlin, and we're here to talk about the education system in Pakistan. Pakistan. Education in the United States is highly valued. It is required by law to attend school until age 18. Most jobs in today's economy require a college degree, and we as citizens of all genders get the opportunity to attend college and earn a degree. The annual spending budget on education within the U.S. is 5.4%. In Pakistan, 3 million girls are out of school and the Pakistani government spends 2.3% of their budget on education. In some places, like the Swat Valley, it was required by law for girls not to attend school. Only about half of Pakistan's population is able to secure an adequate nutritional intake and only about half of the population is literate. The United States claims to be sending aid to countries like Pakistan, but only about 2.1% of that aid since 2001 is being used towards education. How the education system is set up is similar in some ways to ours, but different once you get past middle school. In America, most school systems are set up for kindergarten through fifth grade, then middle school from sixth to eighth grade, then high school from ninth to twelfth grade. In Pakistan, primary education is called junior school, which is grade one through five. After that, children attend middle school from sixth to eighth grade. During middle school, this is where the divide occurs between the, between the genders and single-sex education becomes more predominant. After middle school, the child attends secondary school starting at ninth grade and lasting four years. After the end of each school year, the students are required to pass a national examination administered by a regional board of intermediate and secondary education. Students then enter an intermediate college and complete grades 11 and 12. Upon completion of each of these two grades, they again take these tests, and when successful, they get their certificate, or HSC. This is the level of education that's also known as intermediate. As you can see, through the education system in Pakistan, there are gender inequalities that follow along with the flawed education system. Also, women are seen as a lesser person compared to men in the Pakistani nation. Women are mostly subjected into staying at the home all day and raising the family. The man is supposed to bring in all the income for the house and be the only one in the house with an education. In Pakistan today, two-thirds of the girls' population is out of school. That's three million girls who are uneducated in Pakistan. There are women's rights, like Malala, who advocate for women's education. Malala is a girl that was shot by the Taliban when she was 15, but luckily she survived the attack and continues to fight for equality. Oops. But in most parts of the country, the only jobs that women receive are domestic. Their sole role is to be a mom and raise their children. Pakistan was named the second worst country to live in if you were a female in the world. They were ranked this way on the basis of their education system and the job market for women. Pakistan is going to face many challenges in the future if two-thirds of their female population cannot read or write. This is why female activists like Malala are important to their culture. Adult illiteracy rate is 53% among all people, but only 79% of the males ages 15 through 24 are literate in Pakistan. And only 61% of females ages 15 through 24 are literate. The percentage of male students that attend secondary school is only 34%, and the percentage of female students that attend secondary school is even less at 28%. One of the biggest areas of contention between the United States and Pakistan is culture. Quite frankly, we know very little about their culture. Well, this afternoon, we're going to learn a little bit more about the kind of foods they eat and about their religious beliefs. Well, hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to teach you about the religions that are practiced within Pakistan, as well as what their traditions are. Most people believe in one God, as well as that Muhammad was the final messenger for him. Islam is derived from the Judeo-Christian tradition and regards Abraham, Abraham, and Jesus, Isa, and recognizes the validity of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Pakistani cuisine is a refined blend of various regional cooking traditions of South Asia. Pakistani cuisine is very similar to North Indian cuisine, but incorporates noticeable Afghan, Central Asian, and Middle Eastern influences. 
Kelly. I'm Jeff. And this is Cooking with Section 7. So these are the spices. We're going to add a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, and a little bit of chili powder. We're going to be adding the tomato, oh. <laughs> which has a lot of water in it. And we're just going to stir that in. Do you want to stir? Sure. So now we're going to be adding in the lemon juice and the onions, so go for it, Jeff. Until, it starts, um, until the onions start to soften. And last but not least, we're going to add chickpeas to the meal. And chicken. Mm -hmm. Alright, welcome back. And this is the dessert portion of our show. So, we're going to start off by making Pakistani and Indian influenced cakes, but Americanized for the sake of us making it simply. So Jeff's gonna help me out here and make his own cake. And we're gonna start off by putting the pound cake slices on top of our strawberry jello. So just grab one, put it on top. And in Pakistani culture, they like to use a lot of rice and fruits and nuts in their desserts. So we're gonna try and incorporate as much as we can. Um, with that being said, we're gonna add some banana slices to on top of our cake. Just add on the jello or anywhere, whatever you're feeling. You're just doing that three? Yep. Okay. So after that, we're going to lather it in a bunch of Cool Whip, which who doesn't love Cool Whip? So that's how we'll be frosting our cakes. Boom. That's my favorite part. Last but not least, we're going to add our chopped, salted, roasted almonds and our dried cherries but Jeff won't be adding any <laughs> because he's allergic, <laughs> so that's just me. But do you want to add dried cherries to yours? No. <laughs> Pakistan has an interesting place on the world stage. First of all, it's a nuclear power, which many people don't know. Also, it's a country that is supposedly an ally of the United States, but that relationship is far from tension-free. In this segment, we're going to look a little bit at the ups and downs between the U.S. and Pakistan. Hi, I'm Sarah Fishback. Hi, I'm Caitlin Quinn. The U.S. and Pakistan have a very complex and historical relationship. In October of 1947, Pakistan declared independence from Britain and began interacting with the U.S. And during the Cold War, the U.S. and Pakistan were two allied powers against the USSR. However, the two know each other as more than just than simply diplomatic relations. In 1972, the United States President Richard Nixon visited China thanks to the planning help of Pakistani officials. Their relationship strengthened after Operation Cyclone, and which was an operation against the Soviet Union in the 1980s. But with the positive interactions between the two allied powers comes negative aspects as well. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the relationship between the U.S. and Pakistan was damaged when the United States approved an amendment attacking Pakistan's nuclear weapons program. Fun fact, Pakistan is one of the United States' biggest trading partner. Recently, one of Pakistan's ambassadors, Dr. Maliha Lodhai, made a statement at the 2015 substantive session of the United Nations Disarmament Commission, and he made some suggestions on how to strengthen global security. I'm Sarah Fishback. I'm Caitlin Quinn, and that concludes our report. That concludes our program. We hope you've learned a little bit about Pakistan that you didn't know before, and we hope this encourages you to find out more not only about Pakistan, but about other nations in the global community. Good afternoon.